Uh, good morning. Welcome to Mahogany Row of the Library of Congress. It's great to see you all here today. Um, we're going to, my name is Matt Barton. I'm the uh, curator of recorded sound at the National Audiovisual Conservation Center, which we used to be known as the uh, uh, Moving Image Broadcast and Recorded Sound Division, uh, as many people in this room know when it was based up here. Now we're mostly based down there. Um, and, uh, but we wanted to bring a few of the treasures up and also show some of the work that we do here today. And we're going to start mm, um, more or less at the beginning of uh, recorded sound with cylinders. And uh, we'll have uh, two, uh, two of the wonderful people who work with us. Uh, David Sager, who is a reference specialist and also a uh, crack trombonist and a, uh, really an authority on early recording, um, and Melissa Wadzinski, one of our sound preservation specialists in Culpeper, who's done something like, what is it, 4,000 cylinders? Uh, you can look her up in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, they'll be here to talk about Edison cylinders and to play you a few of them. So, uh, please, a warm welcome to David Sager and Melissa Wadzinski. Starting with David, you going to kick this off? I will kick this off. All right. Most of you and work with a lot of you, I can safely say that you all have ruined my opening line, which was going to be that I can't assume in a crowd like this that everybody knows what this is. And, but I guess you all do. But the 10 inch disc record could only <clears throat> provide three minutes of music per side. You would get two songs. Oh, before this record was made, you would only get one selection because it was a single face recording. On the competing cylinder, you got two minutes, if that, give or take a few seconds. Most folks say the off the cuff and uh, informally, if they're having informal conversations about cylinder records, I don't know how many of you do that, uh, <clears throat> that they preceded disc recordings. And in a way they did. Uh, Thomas Edison's tin foil recording on a cylindrical drum was certainly around before the advent of disc recordings. But for the most part, cylinders and discs paralleled each other and rivaled each other. I see Jerry Fabris over there who is far more an expert than I, so just laugh inside, will you please? <laughs> I'm going to play for you a two-minute cylinder by Len Spencer who was a native of Washington, D.C., and he was a prolific, really prolific recording artist. Um, did all kinds of uh, selections, songs, and comic routines. He would recite um, famous speeches, made several copies, uh, versions of the Gettysburg Address and uh, William McKinley's uh, final address, etc. But this is an advertising record that the dealers, that the, the phonograph dealers would sell and would use to demonstrate, they didn't sell these, they would use these to demonstrate the, uh, the machines for the customers. And so I'm going to let Len Spencer tell you, you've got to wind this thing up by the way. tell you all about the Edison phonograph. Edison being the company that made this phonograph, not necessarily because it was Thomas Edison's invention. <clears throat> A little more on that later, maybe.
I can sing you tender songs of love. I can give you merry tales and joyous laughter. I can transport you to the realms of music. I can cause you to join in the rhythmic dance. I can lull the babes to sweet repose or wake an enlightened heart with soft memories of youthful days. No matter what may be your mood, I am always ready to entertain you. When your day's work is done, I can bring the theater or the opera to your home. I can give you grand opera, comic opera, or ghost dance. I can give you sacred or popular music, dance, orchestra, or instrumental music. I can render solo, duet, trio, quartet. I can aid in entertaining your guests. When your wife is worried after the cares of the day and the children are boisterous, I can rest to the one and quiet the other. I never get tired, and you will never tire of me, for I always have something new to offer. I give pleasure to all, young and old. I will go wherever you want me, in the parlor, in the sick room, on the court, in the camp, or to your summer home. If you sing or talk to me, I will retain your songs or words and repeat them to you at your pleasure. I can enable you to always hear the voices of your loved ones, even though they are far away. I talk in every language. I can help you to learn other languages. I am made with the highest degree of mechanical skill. My voice is the clearest, smoothest, and most natural of any talking machine. The name of my famous master is on my body and tells you that I am a genuine Edison photograph. The more you become acquainted with me, the better you will like me. Ask the dealer. He brought up one of the very important uh, distinctions about having a cylinder phonograph in that you could easily make your own recordings because every Edison cylinder phonograph came with a recording head rather in addition to uh, what is known as the reproducer which is what uh, it's kind of the equivalent to a phonograph cartridge but you would have a reproducer and a recorder and you could purchase wax blanks, make your own cylinders at home. They even published a little book telling you how you could do it and uh, sometimes recommended that you would have more than one recorder with different thicknesses of uh, diaphragm, glass diaphragm inside for different kinds of recordings. <clears throat> with discs, you really could not do that. There were some, um, some manufacturers that, that came out with um, recordable discs, but it didn't work nearly as well. But if you had a disc phonograph, and, and by the way, this machine is from circa 1908 to 1910. And during the same time, most Americans had a Victrola from the Victor Talking Machine Company that played disc records. So they really did parallel each other. Discs were much easier to store. Cylinders were more awkward, usually in a, in a, like a dresser with drawers that had pegs in it that you would store the cylinder and you would discard uh, the boxes that they came in. One of, the, um, one of the other distinctions, cylinders tended to sound more lifelike than discs at the time. Um, there was, they uh, employed a different kind of groove cut. Um, the recording stylus undulated up and down as opposed to side by side, side to side, as in uh, disc recordings. And that allowed for less blast on loud passages and also to reproduce sibilance. Initially, when you bought a phonograph, you could either get what they call way tubes which you put in your ears, like earbuds, or you would get a straight, completely straight horn, flaring horn of, of various sizes. The Edison Company, around 1908, 1909, came up with this design. It was called the signet horn because it was shaped like a swan, like the French word for swan. on the mark here. 
And they claimed it was because people were bumping their heads on the other kinds of horns. Usually you had your machine up on a cupboard and you would come down here and you would pull out a drawer to get your cylinder and you would hit your head and then you would drop the cylinder as I just did. And, uh, but, then, but then it would break because the most cylinders were not indestructible at that time. But the signet horn sounded much better and projected with greater clarity um, it was very directional, so that's kind of why I was doing, doing this. I tell you what, I will play part of a musical selection and, and then bring up Melissa, who can um, play for you some, uh, some of these cylinders that were uh, transferred uh, electrically with a very, very fancy and expensive cylinder player, the inventor of which is somewhere in this room. This is a Irving Berlin song, 1908-1909. Of a uh, sensitive topic, and I'll play it anyway. It's called "My Wife's Gone to the Country." Hurrah, hurrah! <laughs> it's sung by Bob Roberts, who was a, a popular uh, recording artist at the time who specialized in comic songs such as this. Even though some of you may find it very unfunny. Pull it out? Ah, there it is. Forgive me. Yeah, that's a band selection, which, but since I introduced this, I can't go back and re edit my introduction now, can I? One more uh, verse with a different set of lyrics and then, a, and then the refrain, which we could all probably sing by now. The cylinder phonograph would generally wear the recording less than the steel needle or fiber needle employed by um, on a disc recording. Um, and not always, but you frequently find, you find cylinders pretty much in better condition than in disc. 
risks. It's a, gen it's a generalization that I'm sure would be easily challenged. Um, were, I'm sorry, what were these uh, rules made from? How, what is the mechanism for Thank you for asking. These are sapphires, which uh, was commonly used for cylinders until the Edison Company developed the diamond reproducer, which they needed to have a, a much harder surface than what was used before, so they went to a celluloid over plaster of Paris um, composition. Melissa, why don't you come on up um, and tell us about the, uh, the gizmo you use to play cylinders down yeah. in Cold Pepper. Okay, I will do. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just give a little bit of context for anybody that's um, kind of not familiar with NAVCC, which probably is not too many of you in the room. Um, but uh, here we go. Okay, so that's a picture of our building. That's the National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper. Um, it's about a two-hour drive to the south of here. Um, and it's our purpose-built facility for um, preservation of any audiovisual materials at the Library of Congress. Um, we have storage vaults and digitization suites for audio, film, and uh, various video formats, and uh, contains nearly four million physical audio recording objects, ranging from wax cylinder all the way up to CDRs. And here's a picture of one of our audio preservation labs. Um, we have nine rooms like this. Um, it's where we work on one-to-one -one transfers of um, any kind of audio recording format. Um, we have six engineers that do this kind of work and one engineer who uh, works on parallel transfer workflows. So he's working on multiple items at once. Um, most common formats that we work on are open reel tape, lacquer disc, and cassette. Um, and then we have two studios that are like this, but are specifically for uh, cylinder transfers and multi-track tape transfers. So for our cylinder collections at the library, we have approximately 20,000 cylinders in our collections, and that's um, combining all different types of cylinders. So you can see the top picture there is a few different brown wax cylinders, and in the bottom picture, those are a few uh, different types of commercial molded cylinders. Our earliest recording on cylinder is from 1890, and that's um, of the Passamaquoddy tribe. Um, those were recorded by Jesse Walter Fuchs in Maine. So nearly 10,000 of the cylinders in our collection are ethnographic field recordings from the American Folklife Center. And the other 10,000 are mostly commercial recordings, such as what you would see in the bottom picture there. So this next picture shows the coolers that we use to transport cylinders from the vault into the studio. And the reason why we use these is because the Library of Congress's Preservation Research and Testing Division um, conducted some research and found that the cylinders are significantly vulnerable to cracking during fast thermal transitions. So we move them inside the coolers to slow the thermal adjustment period down. Um, so they move from the vault into an acclimatization room and they stay there for 24 hours um, to slowly come up to that temperature, which is kind of halfway between vault temperature and room temperature in the studios. And then we'll move them from the acclimatization room into the studio leave them in that environment for 24 hours before opening the cooler. So there's gonna be at least 48 hours of um, time between the vault pull and the time that we open the cooler in the studio. So just to give you a little bit of kind of uh, historic context of various preservation efforts for wax cylinders at, at the library over the years. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but the, the really first iteration was transferring from cylinder to disc. Um, and then this picture is of Erica Brady. Um, she worked here in the 80s on the Federal Cylinder Project. 
Um, and so you can see a picture of her transferring a cylinder to open rail tape. Um, that machine that she's using incorporates a modified dictaphone cylinder lathe for playback. And I think later in the day, we'll have a, an actual dictaphone machine on display in the room next door so you could take a look at that. Um, but then after that, we have had various kind of archival um, cylinder machines. They were custom built for preservation over the years. Um, this machine, it's called a double disc cylinder machine because it holds the cylinder on with two discs on the side. Um, here's another one. This is a Stickles machine made um, by Lloyd Stickles of the UK. Um, this machine is the Archaea phone, which was what we used uh, prior to our current um, machine that we're using. Um, and it was somewhat of an archival standard machine for a good amount of time. Um, but this is what we're using today. This is the endpoint cylinder machine designed by Nick Berg, who is here today. He's um, going to be presenting at one. Uh, and this slide shows a couple different iterations of the machine. So the one on the left is an earlier version, and the one on the right is the um, the current iteration that we're using. Um, this is kind of the most advanced cylinder machine um, that I know of, at least. Um, and it's one of the few audiovisual formats at the library that we play back using a, a modern machine rather than a maintained or modified vintage machine. But it really takes into consideration problems that are inherent to the format and addresses them. And one thing that's really cool about it is that you can use the machine to play a cylinder either using a stylus or optically using a laser. So here's the signal flow. It might be hard to see, um, but basically the, the top picture there, or the top row, um, shows the signal flow for the stylus playback, the blue boxes are the, the analog steps, and then the orange boxes are the digital steps. Um, and we, we really just always are trying to keep our signal flow as direct as possible from the source, so we are ensuring the accuracy of our preserved audio. Um, the, the bottom row is the signal flow for optical playback, so it's, it's an all digital signal flow. Um, okay, so for prior to playback, we're going to try and clean the cylinder surface as much as we can. Um, we have a few different brushes here and a, a little hand blower that we, we would use. Um, you know, and the type of brush we use depends on how bad the debris is and also the material of the cylinder itself. So the top picture just has a little bit of dust on the surface, so a really soft brush would, would um, you know, clean the cylinder sufficiently. The bottom cylinder is in pretty rough shape, um, has significant surface debris and um, apparent effects of oxidation. Um, so even after cleaning with a more aggressive brush, uh, it's pretty difficult to hear the content on that cylinder. Um, the, grooves themselves had really already been damaged at that point. Okay. Um, it's, it's, yeah, so we, we don't do a, a liquid cleaning um, at this time. Um, the brushes are really, and the, the air blower are really uh, what we can do at this point. Um, so if you turn your attention to this video, it's just showing um, the centering process for the cylinder. So cylinders can become warped over time due to physical and chemical changes. And the out of round cylinder will produce pretty noticeable effects on the audio. Reducing those effects as much as possible before playback will produce the most accurate transfer for preservation. So what's going on here is um, we're measuring distances with pairs of points on both ends of the cylinder and um, taking those measurements using the laser. And that's extremely accurate. 
uh, measurements down to a hundredth of an inch, and then there's um, set screw adjustments on either side. Um, so that centering will reduce the wow defects, it'll provide the more consistent noise profile and uh, more consistent tracking force. So there were some uh, earlier cylinder playback systems that relied on doing this kind of adjustment by eye, um, but the laser measurements are faster and more accurate and they'll allow us to have a higher quality reproduction from the start. So this next video that I'm gonna play um, just shows a cylinder being played with the stylus and just notice how nice and level that surface is after doing the centering. So there's also a microscope that's mounted on the front of the machine, um, and we have a camera attached to it, and it's feeding a live view to a screen in the room. Um, it's really helpful to diagnose problems with the grooves, um, and that those problems can kind of make tracking difficult. Um, it's also really helpful to be able to look at things collaboratively with my colleagues so that we can try and figure out what's going on together. Um, and you can see a couple of pictures here of microscope images of certain issues that we found using the microscope. Um, so the, it's very informative to um, help me make choices in regards to the techniques that I'm gonna use for transferring a cylinder. And the goal is to recover all of the informa information that's there in the groove for preservation. So cylinder speeds can vary greatly um, on the, the, the wind-up machine that we heard earlier. You know, it has a, just a knob that you can turn faster and slower. Um, and then this machine, you know, you have to kind of figure out what the correct speed is going to be. Um, I've, I've seen speeds as low as 50 RPM and as fast as 220 RPM. Those, those more in, um, in field recordings. Uh, but the commercial cylinders are going to be generally closer to 120 to 160 RPMs. Um, they were, you know, somewhat standardized, but there's still room for variability in those speeds. So you always have to, you know, as a transfer engineer, be listening and using your, your critical listening skills and um, fine tune the speed to make it sound correct. So we also have an array of different styli that we'll use um, when we're transferring a cylinder. Um, this selection is based upon the TPI, which stands for threads per inch of the cylinder. Um, that indicates how small and close together the grooves are from one to the next. Um, it's also selected based upon how well the stylus tracks in the groove. Um, and if there's distortion in overmodulated parts, you'll try a couple different sizes and see what performs the best. Sometimes it's also advantageous to be able to play a cylinder backwards. So for example, you might have a groove that is running off the leading edge of a cylinder. Um, sometimes we'll see that in field cylinder recordings. Um, there might also be a gouge in the cylinder surface where the stylus will get stuck. Um, or if you have different types of tracking issues during playback. Um, so with this machine, you can reverse the mandrel and play the cylinder in reverse. And then afterwards, after you digitize it, reverse the file back and edit pieces together to hear everything played back um, in the correct direction. So this picture shows uh, the red dot on the cylinder surface, which is circled there. Um, that's the laser that I was referring to earlier that we use for centering, um, but you can also use it for optical playback. Um, and it's a, it's a real-time process, so it's essentially like the laser is becoming the stylus. 
And so when you're setting up for an optical transfer, you need to make some adjustments to the distance and the angle of the laser to get optimal sound quality in your transfer. So this is a very useful tool to have at my disposal for situations where a cylinder surface is damaged um, or irregular and um, you know something that I might not want a stylus to try and track through because then the stylus itself could be damaged. So the optical playback option can be used in conjunction with stylus playback. Um, something like this cylinder is missing a chunk off of the trailing end, but still contains recorded grooves in that section. Um, you can use like a hybrid approach. So I would uh, transfer that first part with a stylus and then transfer the second part optically. Um, you would definitely hear a thump in that missing section, but you would still be able to hear the audio um, content in the grooves that are still there. You can then stitch that together in the digital domain and so this approach allows us to recover content that we wouldn't be able to play with a stylus. Do you have a question, Jerry? Yeah, how does the sound quality match up with the, like in that case, the transfer part with the laser and part with the stylus? Yeah, I mean, the, you'll, you'll definitely be able to tell, you know, that there's a different um, quality of the sound there. Um, the stylus transfer in my experience, has always sounded better, um, but you know, it's something where if you didn't have that, then you wouldn't hear the audio at all there. So it's you know, it's yeah, it's just not going to match up exactly. <laughs> okay, so when digitizing a cylinder, um, I would create two different audio files. The first is the preservation master file. Um, it's a two-channel file with no editing or processing. It's as faithful a copy to the original uh, as possible um, and can be used for future restorations if needed. And then the second file is the access copy. It's uh, derived from that preservation file, um, mono-summed, and then processed with a, a declicker and an equalization curve. And we make that for better listenability for users of the collection. Next, I'll play you an audio example from one of our rarer commercial cylinders in the collection. Um, this is from the Blue Amberol Foreign um, series, the Mexican, Spanish, Cuban, Portuguese, and Argentine series, released sometime between 1912 and 1929. Um, interesting thing about this one is uh, so this is a celluloid surface, um, and celluloid can shrink and it's pretty uh, prone to warpage over time. So that, that was a problem with this particular cylinder. So something that I did to get a better transfer out of it was transfer at half speed um, and then convert to the proper speed in the digital domain. Um, and that helps to reduce those audible um, artifacts from the warpage. <laughs> carece de interés lo que dicen los actores ahora se habla con los pies con los pies eso es traducido del francés toda obra de tener un baile o cosa así para que la mujer pueda gusto si quiere mover hola loritón hola loritín caloría have for you in my presentation. Once more for David Sager and Melissa Winsky. <laughs>